Comics Thoughts, A.R. Hayes. Welcome in. It's a Friday night. Wife's at work. Xander's laying next to me. I'm sure he'll join us. This is going to be video one, possibly two. I want to talk about the actual way it happens between a defendant and his defense counsel prior to trial when they're determining how they want to attack a case. What really kind of got me onto this subject is I was watching a couple other content creators, and I'll put a, a link into the description of this video, who were taking it upon themselves to speak about how a defendant acts, thinks, lies to their defense counsel when it comes to a case like the Idaho 4 tragedy and how they want to fight the case, whether it be go to trial or whether it's going to end up within a plea bargain. I don't normally jump up and down and pound my fists about anything or get overly excited or overly emotional within my conversations, even when I do get upset about what people say or think. But this is something that I have to kind of go after. I do not like it when people who have never been there, never put those shoes on their feet, never stood in the position as somebody else has had to stand, meaning when the hell were you ever arrested and had to be a defendant, especially within a high-level case, and you want to speak out upon how you know how they act behind the doors, how they lie to their defense counsel, how they do this or how they do that, and then you also want to make the claim that the Idaho 4 case defendant will never make it to trial because he's going to end up crumbling and taking a plea bargain. How do you know? You been there? Have you felt what it's like? Have you laid in that jail cell month after month thinking in your mind about a case and how you're going to fight it and what it's going to feel like if you have to go to trial, whether you're going to win, whether you're going to lose, what's the jury going to think about the evidence? Have you stayed up through the night reading through the discovery evidence provided by the prosecution to your defense counsel who provides it to you? You see every single piece of evidence against you? Have you ever sat there and read exactly what you didn't want to read that they got you they've got evidence so strong against you you can't win have you ever laid there and said they have nothing but circumstantial and I know how to explain this just wait till trial no you haven't no you haven't there are many in this world who have but the person speaking upon this like many others have it. It's one thing to be on one side of the line. It's something completely different to be on the other side of that line. And I don't take pride in the fact that I've been on the other side of that line. But I faced life without parole charges. Not capital. Not to the extent of this gentleman, and I've never laid claim that I have. But I've laid in that jail bunk knowing that I was going to trial and the rest of my life was in the hands of other people and I better be right about whether I could beat this at trial or not I'm going to backtrack for one second and make a statement in regards to this defendant and his defense counsel number one when a defense counsel meets with you for the first time within the jail facility to discuss your case they will look right at you and say I'm here to defend you I'm going to protect your rights I'm going to get you the best situation possible for you in this case and I expect nothing more from you than the truth be honest with me. When I ask you questions in regards to evidence or things that are explainable only by you, be honest. 
a defendant doesn't sit there and go, well, I'm going to lie. When my life is in your hands, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to work with you so that we can build a game plan to beat the case. Now, if I don't think I can beat that case, and trust me, every defendant knows immediately whether they can beat the case or not. We know what mistakes we made the minute we left the crime scene. The minute we left the crime scene, we know what mistakes we made. Our hearts beating going, God, I can't believe I did that. And if you truly believe this young man left that sheath at the crime scene, he knew it the minute that he was out of there. He knew it. Whether he knew there was DNA on it, who knows. Now, many people say he pers purposely left it. Some people will say he mistakenly left it. It doesn't matter either way. He knew he left it the minute he was out of the crime scene. The minute this crime was over and he was 15 minutes away from that crime scene, everything would have hit him. He drove his own car. His cell phone, which he miraculously everybody claims turned back on on his route home he would have knew that mistake he would have known about any dna evidence whether it be blood in the car or wherever he was going the clothing he would know of all of that you, you it, it's going through your head a mile a, a thousand times a minute so anybody tells me differently you've never committed a crime where you had to think about it and you don't stop thinking about it. It doesn't go away. I could still tell you the ins and outs of almost every crime I ever committed. <laughs> I could tell you my mistakes. I started committing crimes when I was 11. I went to jail the first time at 11 years old. I could tell you every mistake I made in that case. It doesn't go away. This one, for whatever suspect committed this, if this is the suspect in custody, and I've come out and I've stated, I don't think it is, but... If it is, he 100% knows his mistakes and he has discussed those with his defense counsel. So when somebody makes a statement that all he's trying to do is debunk this or debunk that, yeah, well, that's what you do in a case, for one. You have a game plan and you attack the evidence that you feel as though is the most important and the, what you find to be the the weakest connection that you can get thrown out. So, of course, DNA would be on that hit list. Of course it would be. But, in those conversations, very early in the process, as you were looking at the evidence against you, your defense counsel's going over every step of what they know is going to happen through this process and planning that you're doing. If they feel as though the evidence is so overmounting and you can't overcome it, they tell you that. They tell you that. There's no scrambling down the road like what this gentleman in this video is talking about. You don't scramble when you're in custody and wait a year to scramble to try to find a plea bargain. He would have done that before they filed for the death penalty. That would have already been done, ladies and gentlemen. They would have already been behind closed doors. Prosecutors that are willing to negotiate on a plea bargain are hitting that up within the first two weeks of the endeavor. Your first status hearing after an arraignment They'll have a plea bargain offer. Mine even happened at arraignment a couple of times. There's no plea bargain offer on the table in this case, and the defendant is not seeking one. If I had to put myself in his shoes, which I've been there in a smaller level, there is no chance of a plea bargain. I'm going to either win at trial and go home as an innocent man or I'm going to take the death penalty rather than life in the penitentiary with no parole. 
He's not stupid. He's not going to go do life without parole. Not in a case of this magnitude. It's not happening. There's two options here, guys. Not guilty or guilty, death penalty or not. Unless the prosecution takes it off the table because they've already stated they left that option open where they could even take it off the table. Meaning they're not even dead solid. Sure, they want to go for the death penalty. This defendant has every piece of evidence not only that the prosecution has and has turned over to his defense counsel right in front of him. He sees everything. He knows everything we don't know. He sees everything that's been sealed. He sees everything that's been redacted. He's seen everything other than the crime scene body photos. Yes, he's seen the photos of the blood on the floor and the walls and wherever it is. He just doesn't get to see the bodies. He knows it. He knows it. He knows whether he's guilty or not guilty in his own mind because he would know whether he committed the crime or not. But he also knows whether he's guilty or not guilty based off the evidence that's already in the evidentiary turnover by the prosecution. Do you think he's walking into that courtroom with a smile on his face or, or just relaxed because... They have mountains of evidence against him, and it's all provided to him, and he knows how bad this is, and he's okay. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, let's get past this holy smirking at the, the people in the crowd, and he's doing... No, the man is walking in because he is fighting his case, and he has legitimate confidence that he can win. They're filing motions for a reason. They have a game plan in attacking this. And that's based off the evidence that they have. And they know the weak links. And that's what they're going for. People condemn him like he's slowing down the case. No, he's not. He's fighting the case. And his defense counsel, if they felt as though it wasn't the proper thing to do, would have either recused themselves from the case... Or they would be heavily advising him to take a different approach. Standing silent. Disputing the grand jury indictment. Fighting for actual more real and true evidence. Disputing the DNA on the sheath and how it was gotten. And he wants the IgG information. Which he has every right to have. No matter what you people think. He has a right to get that. Let's see the chain of custody. Let's see the proof in the pudding of this evidence. Show me the receipts. You people say, oh, his car's on uh, video driving around the crime scene. Okay, cool. Show me the proof that it's him in the car. Show me the proof it's his car. Even if it is car, his car. Show me the proof he's the one in it. Show me some proof. It's a death penalty case. You say he's stalking and doing all this. Okay. Show me the proof. I haven't seen it. Your incel theory is probably going to blow up in your face when everybody learns of the Asian gal he worked with at WSU, WSU being at his apartment a lot. Being friendly with Brian Colbert a lot, seen by the neighbors and statements taken by the neighbors, and she worked with him and shared an office with him at WSU. How many people can now claim incel if that's proven and, and out there that he didn't have a problem around women? And who's to say he wasn't dating this young lady? What happens when that proof comes out? We haven't heard from her yet. What happens when she comes out and says, yeah, we were dating? Well, then why would he be on Instagram liking all the other girls' photos? He's dating a young lady. Just watch that develop. It's been known since the beginning but it's just now starting to stir in people's minds and mouths where they're starting to speak upon it. And you're going to hear a lot more about it. 
It's even in the search warrant for his office. They name her by name. They'll be speaking upon that. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the circumstantial evidence is not going to force somebody mindset-wise that sees the entire discovery to all of a sudden be grasping for a plea bargain. I've had many a times I was guilty laying in that rack thinking about what the game plan moving forward to go into trial and what we were going to dispute, what we were going to fight. And I never had a case that had as much opportunity at reasonable doubt as what this case has. I don't care what people say about that. I'm a convict. I'm a criminal. I know what it's like to commit these crimes. I know what gets you nailed. And I know what circumstantial evidence is. And I also know where there's loopholes within that and what could create reasonable doubt. I've been through this far too many times, personally myself, to not be able to recognize things. There's issues in this case, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, there's some evidence that could very well be damning. If that DNA legitimately gets entered in and is able to be presented in front of a jury, it's going to be damning unless the defense's expert attorneys are able to tackle that in a proper manner. It's going to be damning. We'll see if it makes it to trial. If it doesn't make it to trial, how does that case look now? What are you going to base it on? Circumstantial cell phone pings that could be 25 miles uh, radius around a home? That right now it's been stated there's no connections to the victims or the home. Circumstantial. I just get frustrated when people who have never ever been on the defendant's side of that table had to sit in that red hot chair knowing whether you're guilty or not guilty and what you are facing in your life uh, based on the charges you're looking at and you have these people that sit out here that have no idea what that is no idea what that feeling is want to make claims that well this will never make it to trial because i know because i've studied cases and i i don't care what cases you've studied i don't care this case is a different case it's a different person all my cases were a different case a different person I'm sure many people had gut feelings of what my trial was going to turn out to be. And they were completely wrong. And I'm not saying I'm right. But I'm saying I do know what it feels like. And I know where he's sitting right now. He's in a solitary confinement jail cell that's approximately 5 foot, maybe 6 foot by 8 feet. You can stretch your arms out sideways and touch the walls. Your toilet is a foot away from where you lay your head to sleep. You get one hour out of there, maybe per day, to take a shower and stretch your legs and move around. And every once in a while, you might be able to go outside for rec to get a, a little bit of sunshine. But you'll be shackled and cuffed when you do that. So the people that tell me I don't know what it's like absolutely i know what it's like i know what it's like when you lay there in the dark they've shut off all the lights in the in in the day room and you're laying in your cell there's no tv there's no noise happening there's no lights on all you have time to do is think think you think about your family you think about your loved ones if you're guilty you think about your crime and the mistakes you made you'll never forget those and on top of that, you think about how you're going to fight your case and save your life. You're not thinking of lies to tell to your defense counsel. You're not thinking about the way to crumble now. You're already a year into this. You're going to crumble now and try to get a plea bargain? No, no, you're not. You're fighting this full bore. 
you're either going home or you're in this case unfortunately it's going to be the firing squad those are the two options ladies and gentlemen there's no other options in this case go home and that's still for this uh inmate and or i say inmate he's not an inmate yet this defendant his life will never be the same if he gets found not guilty yeah maybe he'll have a book deal maybe he'll make some money from the lawsuits maybe this or that he'll never ever be able to walk in public again ever never his life's over either way you look at it, his life's over he knows that he lays there every night and thinks about that I did too I absolutely did too. I laid there every night and had to think about my loved ones, the mistakes I made and how badly I hurt everybody around me and that my life was possibly over as well. It's okay to have opinions, ladies and gentlemen. It's absolutely okay. Don't speak upon what it's like to be a defendant or a suspect in a case of this nature if you've never laid in the jail cell or sat in the defense chair enduring exactly what this young man's going through I couldn't get in front of this camera and talk to you on this video and discuss the feelings of it if I had never been there before I can give you false claims and false information all day long but I've been there. I can give you the real thing. I can tell you how it feels. I can tell you how bad it hurts and sucks. I don't care how empty you are as a person. You shed tears constantly in the dark of a jail cell. Constantly. I don't care how tough you are. You want to go home. You want to get out of there. But you also want to fight your case, whether, A, if you're not guilty, of course you're going to fight the case. And I've never seen this defendant one time make any type of posture or, or anything come out statement-wise from his side that makes it seem at all that he feels as though he has some guilt in this case. And I'm not saying that he's narcissistic or playing for the crowds or anything of that nature I've, I've battled that since day one I really don't see that at all I see a young PhD student with a full life ahead of them being incarcerated in a jailhouse battling the most serious case that could possibly be presented in front of you and I think he's handling himself pretty well while doing so not many could do what he's doing i probably yeah you know what i could because i i just i i was pretty calm and collected in all of my cases even when i was facing life sentences i was pretty calm and collected but don't judge when you don't know share an opinion but don't state it as if it's fact don't don't act like you know the emotion it's frustrating it's frustrating this is real life ladies and gentlemen it's my real life and that's why not only did I start this channel but also why I put out there that I'm to support the families and the people there enduring tough times in life not even just the incarcerated tough times but even just tough mental times in life because trust me we all slip into ruts and the good people that have never been in trouble make good decisions and go one way where some of us get desperate and begin to make bad decisions that lead us into committing a crime and doing dumb things and then we're battling for our life to dig ourselves out of the rut which could lead to even more crimes being committed is that a good thing is that something to take pride in no but it's real it's real decisions are made every day and i want to be one of those ones that helps support the people make 
better decisions instead of falling in the rut of a bad decision let's make a good decision and how could i help people do that based off of my experiences and i have the feelings within me that they would endure or are enduring at the time that they're considering that been there done that so let's be careful everybody if if you don't know it's okay to have an opinion but don't state that you can make a statement as if you know like uh, I, i'm going to put the link to the actual uh video i'm referencing to I, I, i'm not even going to speak his name i'm I, you could watch it for yourselves and you can see what i'm talking about he's making claims on something he's he he does not know he doesn't have the experience He's got one side of the line experience and now he's making his assumptions as if he could dictate or knowledgeably speak upon what's on the other. You're wrong. You're wrong. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I, I truly appreciate all of you. The supporters have been amazing. This is the Idaho 4 case. Some emotional... Uh, feeling within the content that I'm, I'm speaking upon tonight. I am going to do a second video here uh, later. Maybe Xander will join me and we'll discuss the actual evidence and um, how a case can be built just upon circumstantial evidence and how that case could quickly fall apart. You guys have a great one. We'll talk again soon.